also to have um, Colin Woodard here. And thank you for your patience for those of you that were hoping to be here in February for this. Um, it's the first time I've ever had to reschedule an event, not once, but twice. <laughs> and to those of you who are coming in the room, um, you can grab a chair, please don't sit on the tables. Um, as soon as we're done doing intros, I can come out and I'll help you find a chair. So for those of you who have never attended the sustainability series, this is a partnership between the library. My name is Meg Gray, I'm the science librarian here at the, at the library, and we work with um, Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. Jessica Burton is their executive director. And we meet here the last Wednesday of the month to talk about a sustainability-related topic in Maine. And this, I think, is like our 19th, which is incredible, especially to have so many people in the room. So thank you for being here. And I should also note that tonight's lecture is part of, is part sponsored by the Cornerstones of Science. For the past three years, the Portland Public Library has been a partner library and the Cornerstones of Science IMLS National Leadership Grant, which is titled Empowering Public Libraries to Become Science Resource Centers for Their Communities. So thank you to Cornerstones of Science. You'll all notice that you're sitting, or maybe not, holding a piece of paper. These are some program evaluations. And as much as librarians love a full house, we also love data. So please, please be kind enough to fill it up. There's a basket by the door that you can drop it in. I really appreciate it, and so would my funders. And I also, just one other housekeeping. Next, or not next, April 25th, Susan Gallo, the wildlife biologist and director of the Maine Loon Project, will present, what have loons told us 25 years of Maine Audubon's loon count? We're very, very excited about that. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Meg. So yeah, thank you for sticking with us through all of the uh, reschedules. Um, and amazingly, tonight if it were 20, oh, okay. 10 to 20 degrees colder, we would again have had snow. <laughs> kind of crazy. It's supposed to be 20 tonight. It snowed yesterday. It snowed yesterday. And yeah, so who knows? Uh, but we're here. Sorry? And it might, exactly. We are here and we are glad to be here. Um, actually, my friend Eric said that if he ever bought a ski mountain, he would invite you to speak. <laughs> um, so I would like to begin tonight with a remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on this, the 50th anniversary of his murder. In fact, it is almost exactly 50 years ago, he was shot a little after six. Um, and I would like to share with you a quote that I think is particularly relevant um, to everything. Uh, Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This is from his letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, which was written on April 16, 1963. So we are all, it is all, everything is inextricably linked. And our speaker tonight is one of the most compelling journalists helping us to understand this linkage and what it means for our planet now and into the future. We are so, so pleased to welcome Colin Woodard. Uh, Colin is the state and national affairs writer at the Portland Press Herald and Maine Sunday Telegram, where he won a 2012 George Polk Award, was a finalist for the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting for a series on climate change and the Gulf of Maine. He covered environmental and science issues extensively from around the globe, while a foreign cons correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the San Francisco Chronicle. And he reported for more than 50 foreign countries and seven continents. He's the author of five books, including The Lobster Coast, Rebels, Rusticators, and The Struggle for a Forgotten Frontier, The Cultural and Environmental History of Coastal Maine, and Ocean's End. 
Travels Through Endangered Seas, a globetrotting account of the deterioration of the world's oceans. You will find both of those books on a table here brought um, generously by Longfellow Books. Thank you, Art. Um, he cr he's currently a contributing editor at Politico and a trustee of the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in Booth Bay. So thank you again, and Colin, take it away. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming and for bearing with the regular schedule changes. Um, and also thanks to the Portland Public Library for including me in the series and to the collaborative as well. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about the crisis in the world's oceans and in the Gulf of Maine. Um, this, the former was the topic of the first book that I wrote back, uh, it came out in 2000, Ocean's End, Travels Through Endangered Seas. And you know, a lot of people when the book first came out, would end up asking me, oh, well, you know, how did you come to write about this topic? Why, why did you go around the world uh, looking at the damage to large marine ecosystems? Are you a, were you a marine biologist in, you know, in college? Did you major in oceanography? And they would always be really confused when I would say, no, I majored in East European and Balkan history. <laughs> but funny enough, um, and this is a, you know, perhaps a, a story about the strength of the liberal arts, uh, there actually was a direct connection to that. I ended up getting involved and following down a path that led me to uh, spend a lot of time writing about uh, environmental issues in the oceans uh, while I was living in landlocked Hungary, uh, immediately before, during, and for years after uh, the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. And the reason for that is that in Eastern Europe, I mean, if you, um, the, the, you know, the, there were so many things going on there, but the plurality of stories I ended up writing about, you know, you had um, the, the collapse of uh, essentially planned economies and, and the countries were trying to work towards uh, moving away from authoritarianism, adopting capitalism, trying to build liberal democracies from scratch. There were uh, ethnic tensions that built out into the ethnic conflicts in places like um, Bosnia and Herzegovina and elsewhere. Um, there was the uh, enormous uh, corruption and difficulties as various uh, carpetbaggers came into the region to try to capture uh, the spoils of a collapsing empire. But the plurality of stories ended up writing, despite all of that, ended up being environmental in nature. And the reason for that is because the environmental issues in the region were not tertiary or secondary issues. They were front and center major problems that couldn't be ignored. I mean, if you want to know what, <laughs> what it would be like to live in a world where there'd never been a clean air or a clean water act, go back and look at the media accounts of what things were like in uh, Eastern Europe circa 1990 or so, when everyone started uh, doing stories about the, um, about the situation there. There were, you know, places, um, since there were no uh, Clean Air Act and no Clean Water Act, pollution would be disposed of in the you know, most convenient way possible. If you've got a bunch of nasty toxic sludge, you know, go take the bulldozer out behind the factory and dig a hole and drop it there and don't keep any records. If you've got some nasty effluent, send it down the pipe into the nearest river. If you've got uh, something awful uh, being generated uh, the, to send off into the air, do it through the stacks without uh, much in the way of scrubbing of any kind. And the emphasis was on production, right? The Soviet system was about five-year plans and managers of factories and agricultural enterprises and the like were all encouraged uh, and, and rewarded and punished based on whether or not they met various production targets. You must produce 40,000 brown shoes. It does not matter if they're the same size and they're all left, but you must produce them or else. So the emphasis was always on making sure you hit the production targets and everything else ended up being secondary. And that combination led to all kinds of atrocious problems. You had uh, things like the black town on the National Geographic cover there of Kopchamicha and these pictures here in Romania. You could tell that you were approaching, you know, when you were getting near to the town on a train, which was in the middle of Transylvania, because the landscape would start turning dark. Because in the center of town was this great big smokestack of the carbon black factory. It produces something kind of like a, you know, a carbon toner. And again, it came right out of the stacks without any scrubbing and the like, and then fell out upon the surrounding landscape to the effect that, you know, the people, the trees, the buildings, everything was stained black for miles and miles around as you approached it. There would be, uh, you know, remember one of my first trips to Krakow, you know, this beautiful royal city in Poland, not unlike uh, Prague. 
but um, was located next to a large uh, Stalinist steel mill built as a, a sort of showcase project of the triumphs of, uh, of metallurgy in the Soviet Union. And it was dropping down all kinds of stuff onto the town at night to the effect that all of the gargoyles and all the, the stone statuary from the medieval period was all melting away, you know, like a, like a, a candle when it's melting down. And people had instructed me, you know, in my guest house, you know, make sure you don't use the water. Um, you know, don't use it to wash your hands. Don't get your rings anywhere near it because it corrodes metal. You know, don't go outside at night in the gorgeous streets because that's when they unleash the worst of the, uh, of the pollutants. A little town in Slovakia, in, uh, and in central Slovakia, a cute little medieval town. And I'd gone out to dinner on one end of the town and was returning over a little teeny medieval footbridge over the other and the stars were out and I was headed back to my guest house and I remember walking down, the, down towards the little cute bridge and suddenly entering some kind of invisible cloud of some toxic substance that you couldn't breathe and you're sort of choking and your you know, eyes starting to water and turning red and having this moment of not knowing whether or not I was going to be able to hold my breath and run to get back up high enough out of the hollow to get out of it before passing out. I mean, they were, this was an everyday occurrence. You'd run into problems like this. And in Budapest, the city that I lived in uh, for most of the time that I was there, um, most of the, uh, you know, the, the Danube River runs right through the middle. It's very dramatically. And everything in Hungary is named after and keyed off the Danube. You know, the Hungarian uh, airline Malev, now defunct, but in those, time day, uh, in those times and days, their frequent flyer program was the Danube program, and you hear the blue Danube waltz, and everything would be named after the Danube this and the Danube that, and Danube radio, and Danube television, and so on and so forth. But the Danube itself was no longer blue or pleasant because um, half of the um, sewage released from the city of two and a half million was, uh, was sent right into the river with only tertiary treatment, meaning kind of they screened the big bits out. The rest of it went right into the river system. And this was causing all sorts of problems, and that's what first started drawing my attention to this story, because there were a lot of environmental problems we were covering. You, know, you had you know, factories on one side of a border that were um, you know, letting out uh, effluent or letting out and releasing things into the air that were coming over to the other side of the border and all those kind of stories. But the Danube ended up being a really intriguing one because it seemed to start capturing all of the symbols of what was going on in the region at the time. Because Budapest was not alone in the way that it was treating its uh, effluent. The Danube was an enormous system. It's 1,800 miles long. And, uh, and goes through and drains uh, the large parts of 11 countries, starting from the Black Forest to Germany on the left there, and running all the way down through Austria and Hungary and down through Serbia and Romania, and uh, forming, the, uh, forming the border with Bulgaria, all the way down that area, an enormous area. And half of it you know, was in the west, and part of it was in the east, and none of these countries actually got along, and they were all depositing all kinds of pollution into the river system. There'd be problems with these trans-border issues because as I said, there were ethnic conflict and all kinds of uh, problems that were starting to surface because the old uh, tensions, the old history of, uh, of, of war and strife between many of these countries was coming unthawed after being uh, frozen out during the communist period. And so you had historic enemies like Romania and Hungary and you know, you'd be over in Romania and somebody would have a mine with a large sludge pool full of uh, cyanide-laced water and they didn't know exactly what to do with it. And then one day they would just sort of, you know, release it all to flow down the nearest stream across the border into Hungary and down into the Tisza River where it would flow towards Solnok, a big provincial city, and set off alarms at the water treatment plant because that's where Solnok gets its drinking water. Ha ha ha, taught those Hungarians, right? That kind of stuff would be going on. And the Hungarians, of course, could respond in their own way because there were rivers that, and tributaries that started in Hungary and came back into Romania. There are all these sort of tit-for-tat things going on, and nobody was cooperating. If you send your, uh, your, your, um, your sewerage into the river at Budapest, it's going to be carried away conveniently down to the Serbs and Romanians and, and, on, and onwards out, and it's no longer your problem. And there was a lot of that going on. So, the effect was that there were all kinds of, um, all kinds of um, stresses entering the Danube River. Since once you left Austria and you went downstream into what had been the Soviet Empire, there were almost no water treatment facilities of any kind in any of the cities. Budapest wasn't alone. You had Bucharest, a city of two million that was releasing all of its sewage in that fashion. Uh, Bratislava, a city of 500,000, same thing. Belgrade, two million. In fact, every single community south of uh, the Austrian border on that map in the watershed 
was releasing their sewerage without proper treatment into the river systems that eventually flowed in this watershed down into the Danube River. And on top of that, because there were, um, there were all these incentives towards production, throughout the farms of this breadbasket of the eastern half of the continent, um, many of the state farms all were encouraged to maximize production. You needed to, have, uh, you needed to produce a, X amount of a wheat or grain or corn. And therefore, since the fertilizer inputs from the Soviet Union were sold at highly subsidized rates, they were essentially free chemical fertilizers brought in, you had every incentive to, well, you know, the, the instructions say you need to use one ton per hectare or whatever. We better use 15 because, hey, you don't want to take any chances, right? So there's enormous overuse of fertilizers and you wanted to maximize production so you would cut down every last tree up to the border of every stream so you could plant that many more individual plants. So you had terrible erosion coming into the river systems as well. And so all of this was generating all kinds of massive problems. Um, this all became a metaphor, right, for the problems of the region. You had all of this, uh, you know, countries not cooperating and enormous differences between East and West as the communist empire ended. But um, many of us started writing the stories and many of us clever journalists would say, oh, here's the big picture. You know, you got an entire uh, river system and nobody's cooperating and here it's showing all of the problems that the region and Europe are going to face as they try to bond together again. But it turns out that none of that was quite big picture enough. We weren't thinking big enough about the issue, even as we thought about this sort of half continent wide watershed, because nobody was asking what really should have been a fairly basic question, which was, where does all of this go that set it up in the Danube River, right? It never, never really crossed anybody's path. And of course, the answer is that all of this stuff goes into the Black Sea. That whole watershed you see on the left is the Danube system, and it all flows into the Black Sea. All of that fertilizer and runoff and sewerage runoff and every other imaginable pollutant that ends up draining eventually into your rivers was flowing into this landlocked sea the size of California with only one exit through the Straits of Bosphorus, you know, there by Istanbul. And it was causing uh, all kinds of troubles, unnoticed by anybody, I'm not really alerted by anybody in the science community. And that resulted in all of a sudden, in the early 1990s, the sudden precipitous and surprise collapse of the entire Black Sea ecosystem. Now remember, this is a sea that had sustained you know, humanity since the ancient Greeks, right? And the, the, the Russians and the, the granary of the Greek empire and the Ottomans and, the, and, the, and Russia and Ukraine had all been on these shores of the sea and people had been sustaining themselves through these giant anchovy herds that would, that would circle the Black Sea like clockwork. It was a major component of life in that part of the world. And in short order, just a few years, you had a collapse of almost every imaginable commercial fish species by 90% or more. In fact, it was worse than that. It ended up being reduced to a sea that was consisted of just slime and jellies. And again, it happened without any warning, without anybody realizing that it was taking place. And how did that happen? Well, several reasons. And this is an important thing to understand with the problems facing marine systems. One of the reasons was the one I started describing of all of that fertilizer and sewage and stuff entering the Danube River system. And that was all an agricultural problem, right? You had the effect of all of that stuff coming into the river, but at the same time, Humans in different countries that, again, didn't get along, didn't coordinate with one another, were also changing the, hydro the hydrography of the river systems because the river had all these sort of natural cleansing mechanisms in the form of internal wetlands where the river would slow down and meander and break into different paths and go through some slow-moving area with all kinds of you know, salt marsh-like um, uh, plants and stuff that would clean up the river and absorb a lot of the the um, fertilizers and the like. But these were also impediments to navigation on what is an international waterway and was, uh, and is, was increasingly relied upon to move uh, um, heavy materials uh, in and out of uh, Central Europe through the Black Sea and then onto the world's oceans. And so over the decades, more and more of these wetlands were being filled in or canals dug through them in lines so that ships could pass faster or entire dam systems being created. And towards the end in the late 80s, just before the Black Sea catastrophe started, there'd been a couple major projects completed. There was an enormous dam finish that, that bypassed 
a whole bunch of wetlands on the border between um, um, Serbia and uh, Bulgaria. But then up near me in Hungary, a story that I'd been covering uh, in those previous years, it was an enormous project on the Hungarian-Slovak border to move the Danube River away from a massive wetland and have it run through an artificial channel for several miles, gaining, uh, gaining height over the normal riverbed so it could be dropped through a hydroelectric dam, a project that was ultimately completed. And each one of these things slowly removed one after another of the various filters on the river system. And then, these of course was the late 80s, right, and the early 90s, the late 80s were the end of the Ceausescu regime in Romania, the mad dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, who had many strange ideas, but among them was the idea that the greatness of the Romanian people was tied very much to the number of Romanian people there were, and that he wanted to increase that number as, as quickly and thoroughly as possible. Uh, through um, you know, banning all forms of contraception and creating the, the uh, crises that uh, ended up with all those orphanages you may remember. But to feed all of those people, he also wanted to create and boost the food production, particularly the rice industry. And this was going to be done by bulldozing and destroying the biggest wetland of them all, the ultimate sponge and cleansing device in the entire Danube system, which is at the mouth of the river as it enters the Black Sea down there in Romania. It's the Danube Delta. It's not unlike the, uh, the, the delta at the end of the Mississippi River. An enormous wetland, largest in Europe, uh, therefore you know, a key place that all kinds of migratory birds go and so on and so forth, but also a key filter at the end of the whole system. And Ceausescu was sending in the bulldozers and dredges to turn them into a series of rice patties to increase uh, Romania's production and feed his uh, advancing legions of people. The problem, of course, was that once you actually did that, the salt water would start leaching back into the system and kill all the rice, but not before you removed many of the beneficial uh, wetlands. So the combination of all of those things seemed to have finally pushed the Black Sea to a tipping point. It caused a dramatic increase between the 1950s and the 1980s of the key indices of, uh, of fertilizers and nutrients going into the Black Sea, a 30-fold increase, in fact, of, um, of uh, the, the biomass of the uh, animals that feed off that stuff. Why would that be a problem? Why would you mind if you had nutrients and a lot of uh, marine algae taking advantage of them, right? Nutrients don't even sound scary. How can you get upset about nutrient pollution? Well, I mean, it's one of those things where a little bit is good, but too much is a really, really bad thing. And that's very much true in the oceans because in the oceans, you know, when you think about it, you know, the, the the ocean's basic ecosystem is very similar to that on land. It all begins, the, the, the bases of the food chain are with plants, you know, using um, photosynthesis to, to, um, to you know, create um, organic matter from the sun. Except in the oceans, the vast majority of this plant matter is invisible, floating, microscopic plants, uh, marine algae, phytoplankton. And fortunately for phytoplankton, they have almost everything they need right in the ocean environment, with one exception. They don't have a lot of the nutrients, the phosphorus and nitrogen that they need. And so therefore, those end up often being the limiting factor. You add those nutrients to many places in the oceans, and the uh, phytoplankton will respond, and you'll get a bloom of these algae, which other things like to eat. Hey, that's good. But what if you get an enormous expansion? What if you have a, a doubling, a quadrupling, or a quintupling of your nutrient inputs into an area like the Black Sea Shelf, which is what was happening? Well, the answer is that suddenly all of these uh, uh, phytoplankton started saying, hey, this is great, and growing as they got more and more hits of these nutrients, you started getting larger and larger algae blooms. So many, in fact, that they um, started outstripping the ability of things that eat the algae to eat them down. And you started ending up having these thick sheets of algae on the surface, like a lake that's going through eutrophication, right? Where there's too many people maybe releasing... Uh, releasing their summer home effluent into the lake, and you have those kind of problems. Well, this is happening over a vast expanse of the shelves of the Black Sea. And as that happened, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the algivores weren't able to eat them down, you ended up having them, generation after generation of these marine algae dying and falling down to the sea bottom. And they were forming such thick amounts of, uh, of, um, of algae at the surface that light was having difficulty penetrating down to the bottom, therefore starving out the marine plants that lived on the bottom, you know, the seaweeds and kelps and stuff that would be down there. And as this falling of generation after generation of algae started falling down to the seafloor, again, uneaten, 
it was creating a new and more difficult problem. Because you know, nature has a way of getting rid of all of that uneaten stuff. It has the decomposers move in. Marine bacteria down in the soil started working and chomping it up, breaking it back down into nutrients. So that, in a sense, solves the problem. Except the process by which that happens, the, the marine bacteria need oxygen to do it. And they strip it out of the surrounding seawater. Right? Because there's oxygen in seawater. That's what fish are doing when they're moving their gills. They're removing the dissolved oxygen. Well, all of these bacteria were quickly working to eat down all of the uh, layer upon layer of dead algae and were therefore stripping out oxygen. In fact, basically all of the oxygen over entire areas of the northwest shelf of the Black Sea where most of the life existed. And anything that couldn't get away from these oxygenless zones that needed to breathe would die, right? So all the plants were dying, but anything that couldn't move away, crabs and the like, would suffocate. And anything else that was trying to get where it was going was in trouble. It was throwing the entire balance and minuet of the Black Sea ecosystem off. Because even if you were a mobile fish or something that could get away from that area, it was throwing off the annual migration of the, of the anchovies and the herring and other uh, pelagic species that would move around. This fish is supposed to come to this bay at this time of year to lay its eggs. And this species knows that and comes there to eat the eggs or maybe eat the fish, except they're not showing up because they can't get there and they can't get through this spot. And then they, you know, the, the calving grounds of this species are missing. It threw everything up into the air into a completely um, confusing and difficult catastrophe. So I've talked about how you brought in agriculture and then you brought in a lot of um, civil engineers busy in a completely working in different countries and sometimes for completely different government departments and ministries to, to adjust the hydrology for shipping, uh, for, for shipping concerns. But the problems facing the ocean are usually the interaction of many different silos of human behavior that we think of and manage uh, completely separately. And at the time when the Black Sea had suffered uh, uh, these uh, stresses and that everything was kind of thrown off balance, that's when another completely unrelated uh, stress was introduced into the picture. And uh, that stress was carried via oceanic shipping because uh, all the time, every day around the world, you have ships moving, accidentally, all kinds of hijackers from one place to the other. Not human hijackers, but tiny, tiny animal ones. Eggs and larvae and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, juveniles of all sorts of different species. And the reason is that if you go out there at the South Portland Terminal when an oil tanker comes in and is offloading oil, right? And uh, as it offloads, you can see as the, as the vessel gets lighter and lighter, you can see it rise up and you can see on its boot top, you know, it draws 18 feet, 17, 16, 15. They actually can measure it. And you can see it rise way, way up as it becomes empty. And hey, when it leaves Portland, it's gonna be way, way, way up above its normal waterline, its normal trim. And if it crosses the ocean like that and hits a storm, that would be an incredibly unsafe thing, right? And it's, there's no oil to pick up in Portland, so it's gonna be leaving the harbor empty. So the shipping industry long ago found out a very ingenious and clever and efficient way to deal with that. You pump ballast water into your tanks to weigh down the ship again so it's at the right trim. And then you head off on your way safely, even if your vessel is empty, or if it's half full, you can adjust it quite precisely and sail to the next port on the uh, you know, other side of the world or, uh, or in the tropical zone or wherever it is. The problem is that some creatures that you end up pumping into your tanks manage to survive the pumping process into your ballast tanks. And some smaller subset of those creatures manage to survive in those ballast tanks as they travel uh, uh, you know, in their days or weeks to wherever they're going in their new destination. And some of those, some small set of those survive being pumped back out into the new environment they discover on a totally different part of the planet. Now, almost always those interlopers, be they eggs or juveniles or whatever it was, um, don't survive uh, very long in their new environment. The environment's too different, the salt, salt content is different, the temperature of the water is different, the predators wipe them out immediately, they can't compete with the local uh, um, uh, species um, for food or whatever, and they disappear. But every once in a while, some creature shows up in a part of the world where it's never been before and goes hog wild. And that's especially likely if the place it's shown up in, if the local ecosystem has been uh, profoundly distressed. 
right? Just like if you get run down, you're more likely to get a cold. If an ecosystem gets really, really distressed, it's much less likely to be able to be resilient in the face of something like an unexpected invader. And this is precisely what happened to the Black Sea, because while the Black Sea in the, in the uh, late 80s was experiencing all of this crisis, uh, a passing freighter from right here off the coast of North America, probably somewhere like Baltimore and Atlantic City, New Jersey, arrived into the Black Sea, did this procedure, and released possibly one, maybe a few, maybe a handful of tiny sprat of a comb jelly, a jellyfish-like creature, about yay long, many neopsis, um, which is native to the mid-Atlantic coast of North America, um, and let it go into the sea. Loaded up its ballast tanks and headed on its way. Except this comb jelly discovered that the conditions, for whatever reason, were exactly right in the Black Sea and that there was nobody there who wanted to eat comb jellies, and it went absolutely wild. In fact, it had one of the biggest and largest um, expansions of biomass, the biggest and largest explosion of a population of a creature that uh, ecologists have ever recorded. It went from something like one or two of these little teeny tiny jellyfish-like creatures in the course of a few years to one billion metric tons. One billion. Imagine Dr. Evil saying that. What does that even mean? Right. One billion. Well, to get an idea of that, that is approximately ten times the biomass or the weight of what all of the world's fishermen catch in an entire year. That's how big the population explosion was of this particular creature. And um, the problem was that unfortunately this comb jelly did not eat marine algae, but rather ate the, uh, the tiny animals, the zooplankton, that would eat the marine algae. So they actually made the algae problem worse. And they went crazy all over the place to the point where the entire sea was suddenly just laden with these jellyfish-like creatures and the algae and not that much else. An entire sea, like I said, that consists mostly of slimes and jellies. Well, how could that be? How could you have such a catastrophic event happen, unnoticed and unexpected by humans, in such a short period of time? And that, that um, covering that story really kind of had a profound effect on me, that that could happen and catch us unawares and be such a big deal and involve a bunch of things that we don't seem all that dramatic and we don't even track. Nutrients, right? A comb jelly, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and modifying um, the, a river system hundreds or even thousands of miles away from the Black Sea itself. And then uh, around that same time period, I was uh, coming home to Maine for a, for a break in the summers and it came back in the you know, early 90s and you had the situation where the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, the greatest fishery, uh, you know, the ground fishery the world had ever known, had just been closed for lack of fish. And then a couple of summers later, I came back and the uh, same thing was happening with, the Grand, with, the, uh, uh, with the George's Bank and many of the New England fishing banks in Maine, although the situation hadn't been uh, quite as profound. And then back in Europe, the headlines were that the European Union, which was consolidating its fisheries, instead of each country, member country having its own uh, territorial waters for fishing, they were now allowing all EU vessels to do it. And you had uh, struggles over the remaining resources between, say, Spanish fishermen and British fishermen off the United Kingdom that were so profound they were having uh, destroyers coming to guard the vessels and keep them from shooting at each other. So the situation was, uh, seemed to be getting rather out of hand. And that led me, seeing all of those things and other headlines happening, to wonder, you know, are these things all sort of connected? Could we actually, as a species, be managing to destabilize large marine ecosystems, not just in the Black Sea, but out there all over the world's oceans? And while I was contemplating that over a course of a few years, well, in Eastern Europe, um, I ended up deciding, when I came back to the U.S. and was, uh, was based here again, to embark on a project on exactly that, to explore it. And that was with the travels that led to Ocean's End, and I was able to travel around the world trying to answer that question as to what was happening in large marine ecosystems and what we might uh, want, to, want to or be able to do about it. And I mean, the, the short answer was yes, we are in fact destabilizing them, and uh, the myriad of problems was quite large. I mean, you would see um, all sorts of difficulties. You know, the um, I went to Belize uh, to go diving, uh, and uh, in Belize you had um, 
Uh, in that year, when I went there off this barrier reef, which is one of the uh, more pristine reef systems uh, in this hemisphere, uh, it was undergoing one of the biggest bleaching events uh, that had ever been experienced. There was a worldwide bleaching of corals that year. And what did that even mean? I mean, I was expecting to go down to Belize and write about how, you know, development, uh, you know, like having a, a new fact, a new, um, a uh, hotel and a golf course on a little teeny tiny uh, uh, island off the coast might cause a whole bunch of nutrients to be dumped into the reef and that therefore all kinds of plant life grow on the reef and overwhelm the reef system. That was the story I thought I was going to write and it was there and happening. But for comparison, I decided to go out, uh, with a dive, with, uh, go out diving in some of the remote places that were far from any of it to kind of get a comparison feeling for what it should look like. Except when we arrived, there was a surprise even of the uh, scientists that I was traveling with that all of the reefs in these untouched places far from all those other stresses were turning white. The corals are, are uh, both a, uh, a plant and an animal, right? The corals are uh, anemone-like little polyp creatures and that grow their calcium shells around them, but within the corals are a plant a special specialized plant that also gives them additional energy. It's like a symbiotic relationship. And these little plants are what gives the corals their unique colors. But, uh, and the corals kind of need those to survive and stay healthy because the plants are giving them a bonus energy. They're kind of like a hybrid engine in that sense. But when, the, uh, when there are certain stresses, particularly too much warm water, that can stress out the uh, corals to where the, for some reason the plants are released from the corals. They all end up escaping en masse and you know, dying off, and the corals turn white as they lose all their color and then become stressed and sick and can fall to all kinds of other things. So that was happening there. I went to Newfoundland where um, they were suffering very, very profound uh, effects on fisheries. Um, the Grand Banks, uh, which had, you know, many of the early travelers wrote about uh, how they would arrive and drop baskets over the ship's side and pull up, you know, entire basketful after basketful of cod as fast as you could, and cod were averaging five and six feet long. Well, it collapsed. In, uh, in a 30-year period, the biomass of spawning cod, of the big cod, had fallen by 98.9%. Not 98.9% since the early explorers in the 1600s, but since 1965. You know, a profound collapse that transformed an entire province, which at that time was completely dependent on fisheries and had been founded for fisheries, causing all kinds of stresses. I ended up going uh, to the Antarctic as well, because it turned out that some of the early uh, indications that climate change might also be a problem for the oceans were starting to happen there in the late 1990s. This is in the Gerlach Straits of Antarctica. Um, and indeed, uh, when I went to, uh, I went to the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the banana belt of the Antarctic. If you think the Antarctic is kind of like, uh, you know, the male symbol, the, the, the arrow going out is the Antarctic Peninsula leading off the circular land pass up towards South America. And that's therefore the most northerly, therefore the warmest and most temperate part of Antarctica. It's still way down there, you know, 64, you know, south. So it's still glaciers and the like, and no, and no uh, you know, large plants living on it. But this was the place where, if climate change is going to happen, you would expect to see it first in the Antarctic, because it would be the first area affected. And indeed, there, just in, in the past two or three years before my visit, the scientists who were doing these long-term ecological surveys and projects were discovering major changes happening in the Antarctic region. The scientists who were there to hang out at these big penguin rookeries were seeing the penguins start disappearing because the, there was uh, suddenly too much, uh, too much or too little uh, uh, precipitation at certain times. You had penguins um, of, that require there to be um, solid ice in the winter time for their strategies disappearing and re being replaced by penguins who prefer open water. Same thing was happening with the seals, so the whole species uh, um, mix was changing. And behind Palmer Station, the uh, US uh, research station that I visited, was a 10,000-year-old, uh, 1,000-foot-tall glacier. And this glacier had been falling back rather rapidly. You could really tell because in the uh, station they had a wall where they had photographs taken each year of the uh, crew of scientists who'd overwintered in Antarctica that winter. And it started in like, you know, 1971 or something and everyone's dressed like the, the Dharma Initiative. And you could see you know, the changing hairstyles and the changing, you know, social mores and fashions as you worked your way through the pictures up to the 1990s. But they always took the, 
the picture in the same spot behind the station. And the eerie thing was when you started top left and you went down to bottom right, you could see the glacier was right behind them when they were taking the picture in 1972, but it was falling further and further back until the 1990s. It was back there like a half mile back from them. Like watching, it was this disorienting experience of watching this mountain of ice that had been around since the last ice age scroll back and disappear. And I also ended up being able to go to uh, the Central Pacific, to the Marshall Islands, uh, one of these all um, atoll Pacific island nations that's uh, particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. If indeed you were seeing uh, a meltdown of polar ice caps, these are the countries that already in the late 90s were worried that they could cease to exist because the average um, elevation of the Marshall Islands for the entire country is something like five feet. And most of them are no wider than this picture you, you see here. The capital of the Marshall Islands, atolls, right, are a sort of chain of islands, a ring of islands. It's actually, when you have a volcano like in Hawaii, and you know how the big island in Hawaii is the newest island, and there's a hot spot under it, and that's why the volcano's blowing up, and it's been scrolling along, so the next island's a little smaller and a little bit younger, and you keep going out to Oahu, is about medium age, and you know, it's been worn down, and you keep going out. Well, if you keep wearing down, eventually, the island will disappear, except that the corals on the edge of the island keep growing upwards, right? So they actually survive, so the corals can outlive the island itself if you wait long enough. And that's what coral atolls are. They're the cap of corals that keep growing towards the surface on top of an extinct volcano. So, and all the associated sand is all coral sand from the generations of corals that have broken up. The people out there in the Marshall Islands are living on the top of an extinct volcano amidst these corals and the, and the refuse that the corals have left behind. So the capital of the Marshall Islands is you know, about as wide as this room and about you know, 60 miles long with islands breaking in it. And there's on one side is the lagoon with the water crashing against it. And the other side is the open Pacific with the water crashing on you on either side of you. And in between is all of the agriculture, all of the residences and all the infrastructure of an entire nation. And they know that you know, when you have a flood surge, there's nowhere to go or hide. So those were all the difficulties they were encountering, and I also ended up um, in places like Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico, where at the mouth of the Mississippi, they were already seeing the expansion of a large dead zone, not unlike that one at the Black Sea. So in writing Ocean's End, it, you know, it clearly the problems were multifaceted. You were having all of those same sets of human interactions happening at once, um, in, in, in interactions where the stresses were often caused by entirely different countries, by different ministries within a given country, and by different sectors that we don't think about coordinating together. And the sum total of the intersections of those things in the oceans could be rather profound and unexpected and lead to outcomes that nobody liked. And so, you know, I was counseling in Ocean's End that we need to start thinking about not just me, but scientists and others were saying you need to start thinking about the oceans much more holistically and our interactions with the oceans. And indeed, the problems facing them, uh, many of the stresses that I saw in the end of the 90s while writing that book have gotten worse. Uh, and I've been able to cover a lot of them. You know, the, at that time, nobody was seeing any indication that the North Pole was melting down at all. The Greenland ice sheet seemed stable. And of course, the reverse has happened since. Um, you know, I went up to Greenland and uh, at one point, and everybody sled dogs, which is kind of the key thing that uh, people in Greenland do to get around in the winter. Right, Greenland, all the communities are all little tiny communities with no roads connecting them because it looks like the Rocky Mountains. You know, there's glaciers and giant mountains between each tiny village. You could never build a road there because it would cost you like you know, $2 billion per kilometer and would link two communities of 60 people and you would never be able to plow it in the winter, right? So there aren't any roads. You actually have to get around by flying or by sea kayak, neither of which one's really expensive and one's rather dangerous. So it's not till the winter that everyone hangs out with each other, because in the winter, the sea would freeze smooth and you'd get out your sled dogs and your sled and cruise around, and it is the big deal. As one uh, Greenlander told me, if you're the guy with the champion sleds, you're that guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> everyone was selling off their sled dogs when I was there because the sea ice was no longer forming reliably. It was forming and then breaking up, forming and breaking up and creating a landscape you couldn't sled on. It had been going on for a decade. So the Greenlanders were starting to give up on their sled dogs, where in the southern part of the country, some of the farmers were growing broccoli for the first time since Leif Erikson was there at the uh, thaw before the Little Ice Age. So major transformations were taking place. Now, 
you know, all, some of these, you know, many of these problems had gotten worse, but some of them were new issues that have come up since Ocean's End that have arrived. Um, you know, I remember I was diving down in uh, Grenada with a bunch of uh, marine scientist types were working on a project, and um, we were all assigned some dive buddy. And a lot of the people on this trip were luminaries. We had uh, Buzz Aldrin was there. There were various scientists and astronaut types, and you never know who you were, your dive buddy was, but I was assigned one, and we went diving down, looking around, popped up. And we're talking afterwards during the dive interval on the boat as to, you know, how, are those, how do those corals seem? And I was like, you know, I mean, I've been kind of spoiled. I've been out to Micronesia and places, and... You know, everyone talks about Grenada being so amazing, but you know, it didn't seem that amazing. He was like agreeing, yeah, it was kind of, you know, all these various problems. He started doc you know, mentioning some of the problems that I documented in my book, and I said, yeah, that's all true, and now I keep hearing about this ocean acidification thing. I mean, who threw that into the picture? Who could see that coming? And the guy got this really odd look on his face, and he says, you don't know who I am, do you? <laughs> I said, no, and well, it turned out this guy was, um, one of the, uh, you remember Biosphere 2 out in Arizona? Yeah. yeah, they're gonna like, in order to get to Mars, we need to practice how you could have an ecosystem you could bring with you. So they put a bunch of guys in a dome in the desert and sealed them in with a, you know, a coral reef tank and uh, agriculture, and you had to somehow make whatever you had in there recirculate to keep you all alive, and it didn't work. Why? <laughs> Too much carbon dioxide. They couldn't get rid of it, right? They had their own global warming in there. But one of the first indications they had a problem was this guy was in charge of the coral reef tank. And he'd started noticing as the CO2 levels in their sealed off atmosphere got higher and higher because they, they weren't in balance, he started seeing the corals in the tank dissolve. And he was one of the first people to see that. Well, now we are starting to see that problem is happening all over the place because the CO2 in biosphere one, as we've added more and more to the atmosphere, a lot of that CO2 is ending up uh, in the oceans, which is nice in that it's keeping it away from the uh, atmosphere and keeping CO2 levels in the atmosphere lower. But the problem is that all that dissolved CO2 in the oceans is also making the oceans less base or more acidic which, you know, not a ton more, but enough more that it's starting to interfere with some shell-making organism's ability to do the little chemical process they need to build their shells, especially at first when they start as tiny sprat and they're building their first shells. Which brings us closer here to Maine and the Gulf of Maine because, you know, when I was writing Ocean's End, you had to go to the ends of the earth to find some of these extremes. You know, you've got to go to Greenland and Antarctica and the Marshall Islands to see the climate change impacts that might be happening. But now you're starting to not have to go anywhere. They're right here at our doorstep. And uh, that brought me more recently, to when I was working on May Day, the series for the Portland Press Herald, to look at the, uh, some of the issues that were happening in the Gulf of Maine, which has turned out to be a place that is on the forefront of climate change in the oceans. Because, strangely enough, it is warming faster than any other part of the world ocean, save a section of the Kyushu Current and off northern Japan. Very, very rapidly. And our ecosystem is perched because it's a cold water system next to the Gulf Stream. We're also kind of the southernmost part of a, a southernmost range of boreal sort of species rather than warmer water loving species. So we're kind of, if things shift around, we're vulnerable to larger changes than you would see elsewhere. And so for scientists, this is becoming a bit of a fascinating laboratory, our own Gulf of Maine, for understanding what kind of climate change impacts might be expected uh, in, in oceans and marine systems elsewhere, which is really exciting for the scientists on one hand, but is not so exciting for us in many respects, because among those are, say, ocean acidification. They're already being seen um, in the series I talked to Bill Mook, who run, runs the Mook's um, sea farms, right? They grow um, oyster sprat, which oyster farmers then use to, to grow out, but they're the ones who actually supply, you know, they, don't, they supply the uh, eggs you grow your chicks from, so to speak but they have to get the sprat to grow out until they're little tiny oysters to ship off to their customers. And they do that on the Damariscotta River, um, and, uh, and they would pump in the water and that would all be fine. But suddenly they were starting to have all these strange die-offs of juvenile oysters, and MOOCs people realized that it was kind of happening often right after a large rain event. And it took a while to work it out, but the long and the short of it was that the, when you have big rain events, and climate change is bringing more of them to this region more regularly, you have a pulse of fresh water coming in from our forested landscape with a lot of nutrients in it, and that triggers that whole process that I described, 
where you end up having a lot of nutrients enter the system. And when you have a lot of nutrients enter the system, you're actually making the system, when, when, you, when you run that all out, you're in actually creating a situation that's like enhanced ocean acidification. You'd have this pulse of, uh, of nutrients coming in, and then you'd have more acid water. And it turns out that the Sprat weren't able to survive it. Well, great, Bill Mook figured it out, right? And he's worked with uh, people in Washington State and Oregon in the oyster industry who've encountered the same things. They've worked out fixes where they can treat the water and grow their sprat. But the question he has and many others are, what about all the oysters that are just out there in the environment who can't fix their water? And the, what are the effects going to be for them? So that and many other things are being visited upon the Gulf of Maine. You're having, in warm water years, you're starting to see the explosion of the green crabs, which were eating, the, eating up many of the mussel flats, wiping out the mussel flats of Freeport and Brunswick and other places. You're able to see those kind of uh, major ecological changes uh, happening uh, here directly now. So what do we do about all that? And I'll open it up to questions after that. But the lesson that I've been saying while writing the book that I came away with is that ultimately the problem is that we have been managing our interactions with the oceans in a piecemeal way when we do it all, in individual sectors and countries and the like, and you know, each, you know, how, many, uh, how much of X product can you dump into the ocean legally, or how many of this species can you take out of the ocean today? But it's all done divorced from the larger equation, which is what's going on with this complicated community of life in the ocean, and how do you sustain that community of life? How could you make and understand the ecosystem hopefully well enough to figure out how to keep it happy? Because if it's happy, hey, you can take a lot more stuff, you can have a lot more fish and a lot more products coming out of it that we might need, but you need to keep it happy and figure out which things will really mess it up. Because there's usually a tipping point. Everything's fine, everything's fine, then crash, it's not. You know, you, you have an airplane with a lot of rivets in it, which of the rivets you can't take out before the wings fall off is kind of the question. And we haven't known enough because we didn't need to, because the ocean seems so very big and we're so very small, to know all those answers in past decades. But now, fortunately, we're starting to try to answer those kind of questions. And the technological revolutions and everything from multi-beam and side scan to uh, uh, computer imaging and the like make it possible for us to explore and answer those questions in a way that wouldn't have been possible 30 or 40 years ago, for sure. So it's an intriguing time to learn those things and to learn those answers so that we can interact with ocean ecosystems in a way where we and they win, right? Because otherwise, nobody wins when you run the system down to be like the Black Sea. There's nothing valuable to it. It's not providing the ecosystem services and the like. So it's not an us versus them. It's a working together with it. But we need a lot of answers. So the first step is gathering those and funding the kind of science and, uh, and monitoring and stuff that lets us know the answers so that we can adapt them into the way we manage things. And here in Maine, I mean, you, people ask with May Day, what do you do about these problems? Well, some of them, Maine by itself, yes, I mean, it'd be good if you reduce the amount of carbon you're producing, but Maine by itself can't do anything about the world's global warming problem because we're 0.05% of global greenhouse gas emissions. If we stop emitting anything, it's gonna make no, uh, no effect by itself. Not that we shouldn't be part of the solution, but we can't stop that. But what we do have the ability to do is things like ocean acidification, where we actually can work towards making systems more resilient if we understand where is the ocean acidification bad, when, we don't have the answers, but you need the monitoring and stuff to figure those, um, those questions out so you know how to intervene to help things. Would it be possible, and scientists are working on this, to take uh, a, a, a mussel farm out there in Casco Bay and put it next to a seaweed farm growing seaweed for the Asian market, edible seaweeds? If you had the seaweed close enough, since it's a plant and it's drawing in the carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen the, and, the, and the shellfish are doing the opposite, could it create a halo of, of, um, of uh, less acid water that would protect both, right? Those kind of questions. How well would that work? How big is the halo? What are the kind of things you can do? So it's those kind of questions that we need to be looking at, and those are the first steps towards working our way into having a genuinely symbiotic relationship with the oceans, which uh, we're gonna need as the planet heads towards uh, a population of 10 billion. And final note, because all of this has been sort of a downer, is the good news is, <laughs> That, you, that when you remove the stresses on ocean systems, they can sometimes amaze you how fast they respond and rebound. 
And one is the Black Sea, because by a historical twist of fate, the Black Sea's disaster happened at the same time that communism collapsed. And one of the things that happened afterwards is that all of those countries in the Black Sea basin, say, uh, yeah, all of them essentially, have joined the European Union. And when they did that, the European Union knew for a, almost a decade that was gonna happen, and that they would have to meet Dutch water quality standards. There ended up being this enormous investment by the EU and with EU pressure by the World Bank in building all of that missing infrastructure, in changing farming practices, in building buffer zones. And also, the agricultural system of Eastern Europe collapsed afterwards because the French farmers in the EU didn't want to compete with those large Hungarian farms on fertile soil. So they made sure that the EU didn't subsidize those farms and many of them ended up collapsing for a number of years. Bad for the farmers, but the phosphorus and nitrogen loading, the nutrient loading into the Black Sea also collapsed as agriculture collapsed in the region. And by the time it restarted, many of these infrastructure improvements had been made. So the stresses were suddenly taken off the Black Sea with the disappearance, the economic collapse, the disappearance of those things, and then the uh, introduction of the missing infrastructure. And then, you wouldn't think, you know, what would happen? There was less nutrients for the algae, and that might be good, but the whole ecosystem's been ruined, right? Except that, one day, a passing freighter <laughs> pumped out another species of comb jelly, the barrow. And this particular comb jelly liked nothing better than to eat Meniopsis. And it went around eating them until there were basically none of them left, and then it starved to death for lack of food. And suddenly, <laughs> the jellies are apparently out of the way, and there's been a slow rebuilding that, uh, uh, that uh, monitors uh, uh, are seeing of a surprising rebound of the Black Sea's ecosystem. So if you remove the stresses, the system can respond and sometimes surprise you, which is exactly what we need to be doing to increase the resiliency of ocean systems on things like ocean acidification in Maine that we can control so that they're more able to rebound from things that at least we, are, we in Maine are not able to, uh, to deal with. So that's my broad lesson. I'm gonna stop there and open it for questions and thank you all for your patience. <laughs> Thank you. We're we'll just do sort of 50 minutes, so anyone who needs to get out of here can. If you really need to get out of here, you can as well. The nice people at Longfellows will also try to sell you a book to their benefit. Yes, sir. What do you think of the recent loss of the wall in Sweden? The recent loss of the wall in Sweden? Us and Sweden, whatever you know. Oh, between us and Sweden, right. Uh, uh, I'm not a scientist who uh, knows the details of it or have reported on it, but my feeling is that I find it extremely unlikely that Maine lobster are a threat to the lobstering communities and the benthic bottom-dwelling communities of Scandinavia. Well, um, so, yeah. The lobsters they picked up were banded. <laughs> they were banded, yes. They were, they were not growing there. We did not pollute their water. Yes. Because of the European Union, if they had managed Yes. I haven't reported on it, but I am skeptical of the Swedish position. So. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Why is the gulf in the fastest forming body on Earth? Right. Like, in a, pretend I'm a kindergartner. Yeah. Why, Why would it be? Why would the Gulf of Maine be the fastest uh, warming body of water on Earth? Well, Anth uh, Annie Pershing at Gulf of Maine Research Institute is the scientist who discovered this and could probably answer it more adequately than I can. But um, I think we don't know for sure why that is. We know it's true from the measurements, but the best guess would be that because the Gulf of Maine is located, so you have cold water currents that are originating up by Greenland that come down through Atlantic Canada, down through Nova Scotia, and enter around um, the nub of Nova Scotia. Let's see, let's have a proper map. Enter around that nub of Nova Scotia into the gyre of the Gulf of Maine. That it's a Labrador current, incredibly cold water current, which is why the water here is so damn cold, right? So numbingly cold, the ocean water. And, and that's true pretty much north of Cape Cod in the Gulf of Maine system. If you go on the south beaches of Cape Cod, the water's surprisingly warm, right? That's because when you're over there, you're on the other side of a great big sort of oceanographic borderline because down there, everything's influenced by the Gulf Stream coming up from the Caribbean through the Straits of Florida up the East Coast and kind of turning and bouncing off Cape Cod and heading out further out to sea and eventually ending up passing Iceland where if you go to Iceland in January or February, it's surprising, even though it's up at the Arctic Circle, 
it's slight, it feels warmer and milder than it is in Maine at the same time, right? And goes on to England even further north. Remember, Maine is at the same latitude in Europe as Spain, right? And it's so cold here. And, and places that are way up, which should be by the Canadian Shield, like England, have a milder climate than we do because of the warm water Gulf Stream crossing the Atlantic. Now, because we're on that border zone between those two oceanographic forces, my guess is the reason that this is warming so fast is that as that's, that you're having a major front that shifts, and because the, the difference between the warm water ecosystem and the cold one, and we're right on the border, a small shift can bring warm water in or less cold water out through our big oceanographic faucets and transform very rapidly what's circulating in the gyre in the Gulf of Maine. I kind of think of it as a, as a cold water and hot water spigot, and as you're messing around, you're kind of letting more of the hot water spigot in and less of the cold is my guess. Now, Andy Pershing, you should all call him up and see if that was total nonsense, because I kind of made that up from uh, what I know. But I suspect it has to be something like that for us to be warming so fast and to be located in that particular location that we're on. Don't quote me on it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I don't know exactly. I know that there's concern that nutrient loading, I mean, nutrient loading in some places has gotten worse and in some places has gotten better when you look at a harbor by harbor basis, but I don't have the answer off the top of my head as to what's the total budget of nutrient loading into the Gulf and what are the trends now. I mean, generally speaking, as you develop more and cities grow and you pave over more stuff, you have more runoff you know, from pavement than you would from natural, you know, ground and that that increases nutrient loading, but at the same time, we're improving our, you know, people are paying attention to nutrients and trying to reduce nutrient loading and do things better and use, you know, have a computer on your giant combine, uh, you know, tractor, knowing which particular centimeter and what soil type is under that from your GPS, so you enter the, you know, so there's, there's two forces at work there and I don't know who's winning, but it's a good question. Yes, please. Right, the giant plastic patch in the Pacific Ocean. So there's like a, because of the way oceanography in the Pacific works, a lot of the plastic bags, debris, toys, bottles, whatever you have in the entire Pacific Basin, including all of Asia and the west coast of North America, seems to get eventually funneled and end up in this giant patch that, I don't know what's the size of the moon or something, Texas or two Texases. Yeah, it's, it's enormously large and has been discovered to be even bigger um, than previously thought. I mean, to be honest, while it's kind of a horrifying, you know, sort of symbol and depiction of our sort of dysfunctional, um, you know, supply chains and the fact that we're producing all this plastic that's used once and dumped into the system, it, you know, the stuff that's floating on the top concerns me less than whatever's sort of dissolving into the ecosystem being eaten by other creatures and the like. So um, if, it's, if it's in a dead zone oceanographically, and if there's not a lot of currents, I'm just running a guess that there's not as much ocean life there, that it's picked a place to park that is probably less damaging than if it had all been thrown into shallow shelf areas. Maybe it's being, if we're gonna dump all that stuff in the ocean, maybe it's being contained in a less damaging place than otherwise. That's my guess, which is why I haven't panicked as much. But the thing is, we should stop dumping all that plastic in the ocean, right? Because it's, you know, it's bad stuff. Animals will eat it. It'll dissolve into the oceans and work its way up through the fish we eat and end up in our, system, our bodies as well. So we don't want that to happen. The fact that it's all being parked in one spot far away from most ecological activity might be a better outcome than others. But and maybe you can clean it up easier if you ever figured out a way to clean up the area the size of Texas. Yes, please. probably worse for the environment than anything because then we'd really be bad at waste management and we'd be going out trying to survive by cutting down trees for all energy sources and all the rest. So we don't want that to happen. We want to get better at the way we do things, both technologically and process-wise, 
and you know, use our resources more efficiently and all that stuff, which ultimately is good for the economy. It's just getting there, right? So um, there needs to be, one way or another, it's happening. The question is, is it happening fast enough to stave off some of the worse and more unpleasant um, likely results of destabilizing the climate and the ocean atmosphere interactions, right? Um, we should be a leader on it in this country because the United States has often led the world in those things. And also because in a competitive relationship, I mean, China knows they have a problem, right? They've got pollution so bad in cities that you know people are dying on the streets and can't go out and everything turns black and you gotta cancel the Olympics or you know what have you. So they've invested enormously in solar power and are you know, changing over into other kinds of energy plants and stuff because they realize it's in their self-interest. And they're gonna capture all those new industries that we could be at the head of uh, instead. So in somebody is going to do it and make a buck off it. Um, whether or not it saves the planet depends on whether they're, all of us do it at the same time. So um, yeah, I think there's lots of, we could outsmart this problem. We just start, need to start making it a priority. And I think it would be an economic win in addition to an environmental and social one. But unfortunately, we're still at the phase of denying the problems there or denying that anything should be done about it. And that's a difficult position to be in, especially if you're the world's you know, most influential country, historically speaking. So we might want to stop that for our own self-interest in addition to the world's. Uh, blue hat in the back, and then I'll come over to you. Going down, yeah. Uh, right, the question is, uh, juvenile population of lobsters in the Gulf of Maine is going down. I believe I read that too. Um, I've been distracted by other things, so uh, I think that's the case and that lobster landings were down a little and it's starting to make people a bit nervous as to what's happening, but I don't know the details firsthand any better than any of you who've been reading it because I've been distracted with other things. <laughs> so, um, and yes, uh, in the blue. Right, well, I mean, I find that in general, having, breaking down and reverse engineering what the problem actually is and why is often helpful to people. Um, you can break it back down into its parts, step back and show how the parts fit together and uh, end up with your rather obvious fact at the end um, is often the most helpful way to do it, but you have to be in a context where people want to hear that. Um, you know, or are able to hear about it. So it doesn't always work. You're not going to do it in a Twitter conversation with somebody who's dead set against it to begin with, but you might in an actual conversation with somebody, you know, over coffee on the dinner table. So context matters. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that that's generally a good way of going about it because especially with oceans issues and the kind of issues we're talking about, it, you know, it doesn't, there's no logical argument to not try to solve these problems because you know, there's no winner in not solving them really, right? It, it doesn't make any sense except in a, you know, a few interests, very narrow short-term plan. So ultimately, if you just can break down the facts and bring them forward, it kind of speak for themselves without having too much argumentation. But you have to be in a context where you can do that. And often people aren't listening because there's so many other things to worry about, right? This book came out in you know, 2000. I was researching it at the end, you know, the end of the 90s, 20 years ago. And almost everything that I was talking about then is still talking about now. I see the New York Times run a story, you know, about the Marshall Islands. It could be the same story I did 20 years ago or about Antarctica. The numbers change a little bit, but it's like we haven't made a lot of progress in the general, you know, public conversation on these issues. We've been kind of standing still. So we need to stop standing still on it. But I don't, I can't say that I've found the key that's caused everything to change. <laughs> Maybe reverse engineering is not the way to go. We'll do uh, two more questions. You've all been very patient, and then you'll be able to get on with your days. Um, we'll start, I'll come back to you, or we'll start with you, why not? Well, something that's been bothering me for quite a while, maybe this question's been addressed, but um, I understand why a ship needs ballast yeah. after they empty, they want to fill up. Once they fill up, why does that have to be stagnant? Why can't they just keep pump in and pump out as they cross the pond and not deliver right. our animals to somewhere in Europe? I guess you could 
I don't know. I mean, I don't work in the shipping industry. I see what you're saying. And I know that there's also been efforts. The more energy you use, the more fuel you use, the more expensive. So shipping companies don't do that. Right. Well, there's, there's an answer. And, and also, I, I will say that I know that that's the general problem. And certainly it was a problem at the, uh, in the end of the 80s. But the shipping industry has also been working to mitigate those problems and have filters so that this doesn't happen with the ballast water. It's not like there hasn't been any motion to try to solve it in some quarters. Um, but the problem still exists because you talk about Wild West, the international shipping industry can be a Wild West. There are good actors and bad actors, and the bad actors can have a flag of convenience from a country that doesn't exist or is in a civil war. Right, Liberia, biggest uh, flag nation, you know, for uh, international shipping. Liberia's in the middle of a civil war, had no functional government, it collapsed into a failed state and all kinds of atrocities. But that was no problem for the shipping industry because their office of ship registrations is in Arlington, Virginia, run by a lobbyist. It cruised on without the state, right? You can continue registrations without the country existing at all quite successfully, and Liberia makes sure that you, know, you don't have to have any particular rules and stuff, and then you control the company through an LLC that's owned by another LLC, and that LLC is in you know, the, some jurisdiction where you can't know anything about who owns the LLC and so on. So, I mean, the, for bad actors, there's almost no way to chase them down. But for good actors, they're starting to do some stuff. So, um, anyway, that's, that some, there is motion there. Um, and I don't know if your solution would be the way to go, but I, I know they're working on things. You just, you know, put us, just sort of filters that filter out to tiny yeah. particles. Yeah. And I think they do that with the good actors. Uh, one more question, then we'll call it a uh, yes, please. tied specifically to marine resources or just in general? The marine sources like the lobsters and um, I mean, generally speaking, the lobbying power and political capital held by fish harvesters is quite small compared to the capital held by whatever entity, the energy industry, right? Or whoever it is that you would have to confront about, say, carbon going down. So I mean, they're, they, they may be big in the oceans front, but they're tiny in the bigger political calculus. So I'm sure it helps, but I, it's, not, um, it's not a game-changing force to you know, have on one side because it's so tiny compared to some of the other economic forces in the, in the political landscape. So yeah, it helps, but on the margins, I'd say. Thank you all very much for coming and for your patience. I appreciate it.